The man known to history as Fidel Castro was born on the 13th of August 1926 in Biran, in Oriente, the easternmost province on the island of Cuba. His father was Ángel María Bautista Castro y Arguiz, who was born in 1875 in the Galicia region of northern Spain. Ángel was conscripted into the Spanish army in the early 1890s and subsequently was sent to Cuba, which, at the time, was one of Spain's few remaining American colonies, to contribute to the effort to crush a second war of independence which had erupted there in 1895. Unlike previous independence movements in Cuba, this one proved successful due to the intervention of the United States and, as a result, Cuba broke away from Spain in 1898. The nature of its independence struggle meant that it now fell under the geopolitical sway of the US, a relationship which would cast a long shadow over the country's history during the 20th century. Ángel Castro briefly returned to Spain, but emigrated to Cuba through the port of Havana in 1905. Amongst a succession of jobs in the 1900s and 1910s, he worked as a laborer for the American United Fruit Company, and by the 1920s, he had established his own agricultural business, hiring out men to work for the sugar plantations. At one point, he had over 300 employees and strong business connections with American companies in Cuba. Thus, Fidel was born into a relatively affluent family. In 1911, Ángel Castro married Maria Argota y Reyes, and the couple had five children. After the collapse of this marriage, Ángel went on to have seven more children with Lina Ruz González, a farm servant who became his mistress and later his second wife. They included Fidel and his younger brother Raúl, who would become his closest political ally throughout his life. Fidel's childhood was a curious one, as he was born out of wedlock at a time when there was still a very considerable stigma surrounding illegitimacy. Ángel Castro had Fidel raised using his mother's surname, and amongst the children of sugar plantation workers, many of these were Haitian and other Caribbean workers who lived difficult, poverty-stricken lives. Fidel's later views on the role of American business on the island's economy and workers might well have been substantially shaped by his experiences living amongst his father's workers during his youth. When he was just six years of age, Fidel and his elder brother and sister Ramon and Angela were sent to Santiago de Cuba to begin their education. Here they lived in poor conditions with a tutor who could barely afford the bare necessities. Curiously, for an island where Roman Catholicism predominated, Castro was not baptized until he was eight years old, in 1934. This seems to have been for the purpose of ensuring that he could attend the La Salle boarding school. He was then sent to the privately funded Jesuit-run Dolores School in Santiago, and then on to El Colegio de Belén in Havana. Despite having an interest in history and geography, Fidel never excelled academically, but he was a good athlete. In 1943 and 1944, he was named Havana's most outstanding sportsman of his age, excelling in baseball, basketball, the high jump, and middle distance running. Castro was growing up during a period when Cuban society was in chaos. In the decades which followed the country's War of Independence in 1898, the island experienced profound political instability and poor economic development. The country's political system was highly corrupt, with the Republic's politicians from the very top downwards engaging in rampant bribery and corrupt activity. Much of this was driven by American business interests controlling large parts of the Cuban economy, and the island had also become a haven for the Italian Mafia and other criminal organizations based in America to operate in. Meanwhile, the economy of the country remained underdeveloped and based on resource exploitation of basic goods such as bananas, coffee, and above all, sugar. The net result of this was that a small elite profited massively, while ordinary Cubans remained trapped in desperate poverty. Then, in the 1930s, the Cuban military increasingly began to intervene in the country's politics, particularly so following the so-called Revolt of the Sergeants in 1933. As a result of this, the overall leader of the military element, Sergeant Fulgencio Batista, would begin to play a major role in Cuban politics, serving as president between 1940 and 1944. After this, he left to live in Florida, in the United States, but he would later return into the fray of Cuban politics with striking consequences. Download Rise of Kingdoms to support the People Profiles 
joined Rise of Kingdom Civilization competition final round, we chose Rome, one of the greatest empires of the ancient world. And like Fidel Castro, who was president of Cuba for 32 years, you can choose what peoples you lead. Choose from 12 civilizations, each with their own distinctive generals and soldiers. Build your own civilization in this real-time strategy game, maybe Rome, maybe Byzantium. You can make it an invincible empire where you will experience realistic battle scenes, use your unique soldiers, architecture styles, commanders, and your own buffs to reign victorious, making you the most powerful leader in the kingdom. Feeling excited? Join global players in an alliance. You will live together, farming, discussing commanders, destroying your enemies, and participating in battles to make you more powerful among the 100 million global players that you could possibly know. Click the link in the description, fight for the civilization you support, to win awards including iPhone 13s and AirPods. This video is sponsored by Rise of Kingdoms. Download it now and support the people profiles. In 1945, Fidel Castro began studying law at the University of Havana. Here, his political instincts first began to manifest themselves as he became involved in several student protest movements against the outward corruption of Cuban politics and the elites which ran the country. It was a highly contentious time on the campuses of the island nation's universities, where armed gangs were common and engaged in widespread criminal behavior, a reflection of the wider breakdown of law and order across Cuban society. At this time, Castro's anti-American stance first manifested itself when he joined the Committee for the Independence of Puerto Rico, a body which had been set up to advocate for the neighboring Caribbean island to be given its independence from the United States. Puerto Rico had effectively become an American colony following the Spanish-American War of 1898, but it was never given statehood status, a situation which persists to the present day. Castro and his fellow student agitators in Havana were opposed to this situation continuing and viewed it as a symptom of America's continuing strategy to dominate the Americas and oppress the states of the Caribbean, Central America and South America. It was also during these years in Havana that Castro first earned a reputation within wider Cuban society for his dissident actions. In the winter of 1946, he appeared in the pages of several newspapers following his criticisms of the government and its corruption and violence. He subsequently developed extensive connections with numerous left-wing political groups within the country, notably the Union Insurreccional Revolucionaria or Insurrectional Revolutionary Union. At the time, police suspected him of the murder of a rival student leader, although nothing was ever proven, and whilst he regained a reputation for powerful oratory, he never became a prominent student leader himself, and on several occasions he was defeated in campus elections. In the summer of 1947, Castro left university briefly to join a campaign to overthrow the right-wing government of Rafael Trujillo in the Dominican Republic. Trujillo, like Batista in Cuba, was a military governor who was supported by the United States. In late July of that year, Castro was one of the leaders of a band of about 1,200 rebels who set off from Cuba for the Dominican Republic with the goal of overthrowing Trujillo. The effort, though, was quickly snuffed out by a combination of US, Cuban and Dominican forces. Many were arrested, although Fidel escaped after he reputedly jumped overboard from the ship he was on into shark-infested waters, carrying a gun above his head. This event is noteworthy for being the first occasion on which the future Cuban leader engaged in direct armed rebellion in the Caribbean. Following the abortive expedition to the Dominican Republic, Castro entered into a period in which his revolutionary activities expanded. He was increasingly prominent within student protest circles against the government in Havana, while during the course of 1948, he undertook a number of trips to Panama, Venezuela and Colombia to meet with left-wing revolutionary groups there, in particular in the capital of Colombia, Bogota. In the late spring of 1948, he was central to efforts to set up a Pan-American Students' Conference, which would act in opposition to right-wing governments across Latin America. Meanwhile, back in Cuba later that year, he married Mirta diaz Balart, a philosophy student. It was regarded as an unlikely union, as Balart came from a prominent Cuban family, which had extensive connections with the country's political elites, the very individuals and groupings whom Castro was increasingly appearing to be an outright opponent of. The couple even received extensive gifts on their wedding day, 
from some individuals whom Castro had protested against, and they honeymooned in the United States. Despite these curious contradictions, the marriage lasted for seven years, and Fidel and Mirta had a son called Fidelito before divorcing in 1955. In the early 1950s, Castro established a law firm with two associates named Jorge Aspiazu and Rafael Resende. However, these were fellow leftists, and in reality, the firm was engaged in pro bono work to defend workers who had been mistreated or dismissed from their employment. Moreover, Castro was developing his knowledge of leftist thought during these years, reading widely the works of Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, the two pioneers of communism and other more recent political thinkers such as Vladimir Lenin and Leon Trotsky. At this stage, Castro was leaning towards changing Cuba from within, and in 1952, he stood for election to the Cuban Congress in the national elections as a member of the Partido del Pueblo Cubana, Orthodoxos party, a Cuban catch-all left-wing populist party founded by Eduardo Chibas in 1947. This was actually the beginning of the end of Castro's peaceful approach to changing Cuban politics. In the same year, 1952, Fulgencio Batista returned to the political scene in Cuba and within months had established a new military dictatorship in the island nation, following a brief military coup. He would henceforth rule Cuba as a one-party military dictatorship with the backing of America. Castro now set out on a path to overthrow the Batista regime through violent means. Within weeks of the return of Batista to power in Cuba, Castro was working on a new revolutionary project which he and his followers, such as his younger brother Raul Castro, called the Movement. Their first action came within months and was a significant moment in the Cuban Revolution. On the 26th of July 1953, Castro and around a hundred others attacked a Cuban army barracks at Moncado in Santiago de Cuba. The attack was a complete failure. Nearly half of the militants were killed by the 400-strong man garrison, and most of the remainder were taken captive, with just a few escaping altogether. Fidel was amongst those who were captured, and he was subsequently sentenced to 15 years in prison for leading an insurrection against the state. During his trial, he delivered a lengthy defense in what would become his most famous speech, La Historia Me Absolverá, in which he attacked Batista's regime and outlined his own political and economic ideas. Castro served his sentence on the island of Pinos, the second largest island in the Cuban archipelago. While in captivity, he rebranded the movement as the 26th of July movement, in honor of the date on which the attack on Moncado barracks had been carried out. Despite this continuing incendiary behavior, Batista took the decision to release Castro from prison in the summer of 1955, after having served less than two years of his sentence. It was a decision the dictator would soon come to regret. After his release in 1955, Castro was exiled to Mexico City, where he and his brother Raul began organizing action against Batista. Here they met a fellow Latin American revolutionary, an Argentinian medical doctor by the name of Ernesto Guevara, more widely known by his nickname, Che Guevara. Guevara had traveled through South America during his youth and had been radicalized by the appalling poverty which he had witnessed there, poverty which he attributed to American neo-imperialism. In the months that followed, the Castros, Guevara, and their followers trained and planned in Mexico for their return to Cuba. Meanwhile, the Batista regime back home was becoming increasingly oppressive. Thus it was that in the summer of 1956, Castro and just over 80 followers left Mexico on board a large yacht called the Granma, said to have been named after a previous owner's grandmother. After a series of misadventures, they ran aground at Playa Las Coloradas, close to Los Cayuelos in Cuba, and were attacked by Batista's forces who drove them into hiding in the Sierra Maestra Mountains. Only 19 of the original party survived at this point. It was an inauspicious beginning to their armed rebellion, but one which would bear surprising fruit in the months and years that followed. From their relatively safe position within the Sierra Maestra Mountains, Fidel and his followers now launched a guerrilla war against Batista's regime, organizing bombing campaigns against government forces. Their numbers soon expanded, with more and more individuals joining the insurrectionists in the mountains. 
Attacks were undertaken against government barracks to attain additional weapons and explosives, and by 1957, Castro was leading a small army in the rural regions of Cuba. Soon, further militant groups were emerging with a desire to overthrow Batista's regime. As a consequence of all this, by 1958, Batista's forces were under increasing pressure from the revolutionaries. By the summer, the conflict began to tip in favor of Castro and the 26th of July movement, as many of Batista's own soldiers began to desert their posts, appalled at the crimes against civilians which they were being ordered to carry out in order to combat the revolutionaries. Eventually, on the 31st of December 1958, Batista resigned and fled the country for the Dominican Republic, bringing with him $300 million in stolen money. On the 2nd of January 1959, Castro's forces occupied Moncado Barracks in a symbolic act, and six days later, on the 8th of January, they entered Havana. The Cuban Revolution, despite its inauspicious beginnings just over two years earlier, was victorious. Castro did not immediately seize power himself. Instead, the moderate lawyer Manuel Urrutia Yeo was proclaimed as the president of the country in a provisional government. However, Castro and his followers dominated the cabinet of this new interim regime. Fidel's military power was given formal acknowledgement in his appointment as representative of the rebel armed forces of the presidency. The new government effectively ruled by decree without recourse to any parliament and given Castro's influence over Urrutia, the leader of the 26th of July movement was the de facto power within the country following Batista's overthrow. Within weeks, the situation became clearer as the Prime Minister José Miró Cardona resigned and went into exile in the United States. Fidel now took office as his successor in mid-February 1959. This was a position he would hold until 1976 when a new constitution was introduced, following which he became the president of the Council of Ministers of Cuba. Castro would eventually hold this until 2008, ensuring that he held high office in Cuba for 49 years following his first appointment as Prime Minister in 1959. It had always been assumed that Castro would be the most influential member of the new regime when it came to power. An altogether more controversial issue was the country's future relationship with its neighbor and Batista's former supporter, the United States. Castro was a proclaimed leftist, but for a time figures such as the Republican candidate for president of the US in 1960, Richard Nixon, believed that Castro could be won over to the American cause. It was a delusional view. Castro quite quickly moved his country towards an alliance with the Soviet Union and like-minded left-leaning regimes throughout Latin America. Moreover, his promotion of radical leftists such as Guevara to senior government offices clearly indicated which way the regime wished to drive the country. Relations with the US were further soured in the first year or so of the new regime's life, when Castro ordered the nationalization of American business interests located in Cuba. Tensions further escalated when Castro attended a United Nations General Assembly in New York City in September 1960, where he openly associated himself with regimes opposed to the US. The growing antagonism soon resulted in an effort to intervene militarily in Cuba by the United States government. Already under the administration of Dwight Eisenhower, millions of dollars of funding had been allocated towards efforts to destabilize Castro's regime. By the time that President John F. Kennedy was elected as president late in 1960, the US government was already working extensively with Cuban exiles who had left their homeland and settled in Florida and other parts of America since 1959. Many of these Cuban exiles had formed themselves into a counter-revolutionary unit called Brigade 2506 and a political wing called the Democratic Revolutionary Front. These were collaborating with the US Central Intelligence Agency by early 1961. However, to avoid suspicion at home and to ensure that the Kennedy regime could dissociate itself from the group, they were training in Central America in Guatemala. Here, by the spring of 1961, a plan had been formulated for some 1,400 of these Cuban paramilitaries to launch a naval invasion of Cuba, aided by advanced US military hardware, including B-26 bomber planes and M-41 tanks. But despite all their planning and support from the US government, the initiative would result in utter failure and would fatally damage US-Cuban relations for the remainder of Castro's life. 
The invasion force set off from Nicaragua and Guatemala by boat on the 16th of April 1961. The previous day, the US had bombed several sites in Cuba. Then, on the morning of the 17th of April, the 1,400 Cuban paramilitaries began landing along the coast within an inlet of the Gulf of Casones, or Bay of Pigs, on the southern coast of Cuba. Within hours, Brigade 2506 were engaged in a shootout with the local militia. This provided a sufficient delay for Castro and his government in Havana to respond to the landing. Fidel now ordered Captain José Ramón Fernández to initiate a counterattack. In the hours that followed, bombings commenced to destroy the invaders' fleet. With this accomplished and the Brigade 2506's escape route blocked, Castro's forces moved in, with Fidel taking personal control of the operation himself at this stage. The initial plans for the invasion had involved significant air support from the US, but this was dropped by Kennedy's administration. Without it, and with their escape route cut off, the invasion force was doomed. On the 20th of April, just over three days after their initial landing, Brigade 2506 surrendered, having already lost 118 men and hundreds more having suffered wounds. Accordingly, over 1,200 Cuban paramilitaries were captured by the Castro regime. The reaction to the disastrous Bay of Pigs invasion was multifaceted. For Castro, he could now claim a great victory over the American imperialists which his regime vilified as oppressing and trying to control Latin America. Conversely, the abortive invasion of the country was a foreign policy disaster for Kennedy's regime. Not only was it exposed as having conspired to overthrow a foreign government, but the botched nature of the invasion looked poor from a military perspective. Though Kennedy's government did manage to negotiate the release of over 1,000 of the Cuban paramilitaries in 1962, in return for over $50 million of food and medicine for Cuba. This aside, the most significant consequence of the attempted Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba was that it propelled the country further towards the Soviet Union in the Cold War camps. Within weeks, more intense negotiations were underway between Moscow and Havana as Castro sought greater trade and military ties with the Soviet Union and the countries within its communist bloc. Then, in December 1961, Castro publicly affirmed that he was a communist, essentially throwing his country into the Soviet camp. In response, the Kennedy administration promoted the idea that the Organization of American States should expel Cuba. A showdown appeared imminent. The Bay of Pigs was just the first act in a much more volatile situation which was to develop in Cuba in the course of 1962, the infamous Cuban Missile Crisis. The crisis is broadly understood to have been the point at which the Cold War came closest to evolving into a full-blown nuclear conflict. The events of the Bay of Pigs in the spring of 1961 had quickly led Castro to begin moving even closer to the Soviet Union. It was increasingly believed, after the events of 1961, that a new American attack or plot would eventually materialize, and that the only way to protect the revolution and maintain the Castro regime in power was to allow the Soviet Union to set up military defenses in Cuba itself. Consequently, in the months following the Bay of Pigs, Fidel Castro had negotiated an arrangement with the Russian Premier Nikita Khrushchev, whereby the Soviet Union would install its advanced ballistic missiles at sites in Cuba. This would ensure that the country would be protected against a possible invasion by the United States or American-backed counter-revolutionaries. It was a fateful decision, one which would create one of the foremost political crises in modern history. On the 14th of October 1962, Major Richard Hazer, the pilot of a US U-2 spy plane, was undertaking a reconnaissance mission over Cuba when he spotted and photographed a site on the island where Russian SS-4 medium-range ballistic missiles were being assembled. Two days later, the American President John F. Kennedy was briefed about the Russian missile sites being established in Cuba. This was the beginning of the so-called 13 days of what has become known as the Cuban Missile Crisis. Kennedy immediately convened a meeting of the National Security Council and several other key advisors. It was decided that these sites were or would soon be capable of launching Russian nuclear missiles and that these missiles would be capable of striking every major American city on the East Coast in minutes or hours. In the course of this initial meeting, Kennedy was advised by several individuals to immediately move to directly bomb the missile sites in Cuba, 
and to perhaps then commence a direct invasion of the island to overthrow Castro's regime and ensure that no further threats of this nature would be directed against America. However, Kennedy opted for a less aggressive action, but one which nevertheless opened a period of intense political crisis in the days that followed. The crisis, which now developed, largely played out between Washington and Moscow, despite the fact that the nuclear warheads, which were causing the crisis, were located on Cuban soil and involved Castro's regime explicitly. Nevertheless, the political gambit that was playing out here was that Russia would provide Cuba with extensive financial and military aid in return for Castro's regime, allowing the Soviets to locate their missiles on Cuban soil. It should be noted that the Soviets viewed this as a strategically acceptable thing to do. By 1962, the United States had had its own ballistic weapons and then nuclear weapons stationed for many years in regions which were just as geographically close to Russia as Cuba was to the United States, notably Turkey on the Soviet Union's southern border. Khrushchev and the principal members of the Soviet government in Moscow believed that they could install nuclear weapons in Cuba in a similar way to which the US had earlier stationed them in Turkey. After all, if the United States had their warheads trained on Moscow and other Soviet cities from close by, then why should Russia not do the same? But if this was their rationale, they were soon to be proved wrong, although in a way which would serve Russian ends in the long run. The crisis deepened in the days that followed the initial meeting on the 16th of October. On the 22nd of October, after initial diplomatic exchanges failed, Kennedy's government ordered what was referred to as a quarantine of any shipping entering or leaving Cuba. The word blockade was avoided, as under certain legal definitions, this would have constituted a declaration of war with Castro's Cuba. American planes and ships were quickly dispatched to the Western Caribbean to monitor all ships attempting to enter Cuba and to assess whether their contents included war material. That evening, Kennedy delivered a live televised address to the nation in which he affirmed that any attack initiated against any country in the Western Hemisphere from Cuba would be considered as an attack on the United States by the Soviet Union. He then explained that the purpose of the quarantine, which had just been introduced, was to ensure that no further Russian military hardware arrived in Cuba. However, Kennedy maintained that the purpose of the quarantine was not to shut off all goods entering the country in the same manner in which the Russians had cut off all supplies by land into West Berlin during the Berlin blockade of 1948. The next step now lay with the wider international community and Khrushchev's government in Russia. In the days that followed, the crisis deepened as America's allies and those of the Soviet Union intensified their rhetoric and willingness to come to their respective allies' aid if the crisis developed into an outright war. On the 24th of October, Pope John XXIII issued a plea for both sides to consider the implications of their actions. Throughout these days, Castro continued to insist that the installation of the weapons was a defensive action rather than offensive but the response which mattered was that which came from Moscow. The first signs were not good. On the 24th of October, Soviet news agencies broadcast a telegram from Khrushchev to Kennedy stating that the Soviet Union considered the quarantine to be an act of military aggression and requesting that they cease activities in the waters around Cuba with immediate effect. This effectively signaled a further escalation in the crisis. Thus, on the 24th of October, and during the hours which followed, the world stood perhaps as close to the outbreak of a nuclear war as it ever has, all caused by the installation of the nuclear ballistic missiles in Castro's Cuba. In the hours that followed, the US requested a meeting of the United Nations Security Council while also sending hundreds of bomber planes, including nearly two dozen B-52 bombers carrying nuclear warheads, which were put into the air around Cuba and also near Soviet airspace. The world stood on the brink of nuclear war. The 25th, 26th and 27th of October witnessed the most intense period of the Cuban Missile Crisis. As diplomatic negotiations continued between Russia and the United States, ships heading to Cuba continued to be checked for nuclear warheads by the American quarantine. Negotiations did open between Moscow and Washington on the 26th, but these were nearly compromised by the shooting down of an American plane by a surface-to-air missile launched from Cuba. Khrushchev subsequently stated that this attack had been ordered by Fidel's brother Raoul, 
rather than being a directive of the Soviet Union. In Washington, a decision was now taken to invade Cuba if another plane was shot down. But cooler heads prevailed. By the end of the 27th of October, negotiations were advanced for the Russians to withdraw their missiles and cease developing the launch sites in Cuba in return for Kennedy's government removing its own nuclear warheads from Turkey. Additionally, Kennedy wrote to Khrushchev stating that the US government would respect the sovereignty of Cuba henceforth and not attempt another intervention such as had been attempted with the invasion of the Bay of Pigs. This arrangement was enough that both the US and the Soviet Union could save face and Cuba's independence would henceforth be preserved. Thus, the Cuban Missile Crisis came to an end after 13 days on the 29th of October 1962. In the aftermath of the crisis, an arrangement was reached to establish better communications between the US government and the Soviet regime in Moscow. The Cold War also gradually entered a period of de-escalation, one which saw tensions reduced gradually through the 1960s and especially in the 1970s, before a fresh escalation in the 1980s. For Fidel's Cuba, the impact of all this was that the island nation would not be directly interfered with by the United States again. Castro continued to move the country closer within Russia's sphere of influence within the Cold War during the early 1960s, visiting Moscow and several other Soviet cities in 1963. As a result of this state visit, he initiated a number of reforms of Cuban society and its economy and politics in the years that followed, which mirrored those which prevailed throughout the Soviet Union. Thus, Cuba would continue to act as an antagonistic country opposed to the United States on its doorstep. Meanwhile, America, for its part, while never again interfering directly in Cuban affairs, continued to impose wide-ranging economic, diplomatic and trade sanctions against Castro's regime and Cuba, ones which would have considerable implications for the country's economy in the years and decades ahead. The subsequent period of Cuba's development under Fidel's rule brought mixed and ambiguous results. Owing to a combination of factors, some of which were associated with the American economic sanctions imposed on the island, and some of which were the result of poor economic planning by Castro's government itself, the country entered into a major economic decline in the 1960s. Much of the country's economy continued to be reliant on the sugar industry, much as that of the wider Caribbean had been since the 17th century. But other developing industries such as the casino and tourist sector which had been growing in the pre-revolution period, now declined exponentially. As a result, the country was increasingly reliant on subsidies from the Soviet Union throughout the 1960s, which at one stage amounted to nearly 40% of Cuba's GDP. However, thereafter, things improved. While the state was the main player, the Cuban economy nevertheless improved considerably in the 1970s and the 1980s, even during periods of general international economic stagnation. But, as we will see, the decline of the Soviet Union in the 1980s and the eventual end of the Cold War ushered in a renewed period of economic difficulties for the Cuban economy in the late 20th century. One of the most significant achievements of the Castro regime must surely be the healthcare system which was built up in the decades under Fidel's rule. Cuba's healthcare system was already one of the most successful in Latin America prior to the Cuban Revolution, but these successes were expanded from the 1960s onwards. Universal healthcare became free and equally accessible to all Cuban people under the Castro regime. Significant investment commenced in the 1960s in response to an exodus of Cuban doctors to the United States in the early years of the regime. The government's commitment to the healthcare system was also underpinned specifically in Article 50 of the Cuban Constitution, issued in 1976. As a consequence, the ratio of doctors to patients in the country increased from a low of 9.2 doctors for every 10,000 individuals in 1958 to a high of nearly 60 doctors for every 10,000 citizens in 1999. As a result, Cuba has a lower rate of infant mortality than the United States and life expectancy at birth is 79 years of age. The country was also highly successful in the 1990s and 2000s in eliminating and reducing the spread of HIV and has developed numerous innovative medical interventions in recent decades ahead of the more developed Western world, notably a groundbreaking lung cancer vaccine 
The country's education system similarly flourished during Fidel Castro's time as ruler of the country. All educational institutions were brought under state ownership and management following the revolution. The education system was, along with the healthcare system, made a priority by the administration and was invested in heavily. In recent decades, the Castro regime spent as much as 10% of the country's gross national product on the education system, roughly twice the amount spent by neighboring developed countries on average. Immediately after the revolution, a campaign was undertaken to eradicate illiteracy in the country. By 2000, over 97% of Cubans in their young adult years were literate. Moreover, a study in 1998 by UNESCO found that Cuban students had a considerably higher level of education than their contemporaries in much of the developed world. This extended to third-level institutions such as the University of Havana, which were also nationalized in 1961. Additionally, the country was highly progressive in how it has facilitated equal access for women to higher education as well as men. Perhaps the foremost indication of the success of both this education system and the Castro regime's healthcare policy is that institutions such as the University of Havana have become attractive options for international students. Despite the manner in which Cuba had become the central theater of the Cold War in the years immediately following the Cuban Revolution, in the 1970s, Castro moved the country to a more neutral stance in the global conflict between the United States and its allies in NATO and the Soviet Union. This focused on the Non-Aligned Movement, a forum or informal union of developing nation-states, which had emerged in the 1950s as an alternative to siding with either of the two major power blocks in the Cold War. The driving force behind the Non-Aligned Movement had initially been India under its Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru and Communist Yugoslavia under Josip Tito. At first, Castro's appearance at the fourth summit of the non-aligned movement in Algeria in 1973 had aroused criticism from nation-states who believed that Cuba was too closely associated with Moscow. However, in the years that followed, Castro managed to pull Cuba away from Russia politically and in the late 1970s, he served as president of the non-aligned movement. Economic practicalities and the continuing sanctions imposed on the country by the United States ensured that the Soviet Union remained Cuba's major trading partner. But under Castro in the 1970s, the country pulled back dramatically from the front lines of the Cold War. Castro's decision to reduce its partisan ties with the Soviet Union was not based on a general unwillingness to engage in foreign wars. Indeed, the 1970s saw Cuba become a major actor in numerous international conflicts in Latin America and Africa, particularly the latter. Castro had always been influenced by Che Guevara in his belief that Cuba was just one actor in a wider effort at international revolution. Thus, from its earliest days, the Cuban government under Castro had provided support to numerous left-wing and revolutionary movements throughout the Southern Hemisphere. Additionally, in the 1960s, Guevara, with Castro's approval, had set up a guerrilla movement known as the Andean Project, with the goal of fermenting left-wing revolutions in Peru, Bolivia, and Argentina. This particular scheme was abandoned when Guevara was captured and killed by the US Central Intelligence Agency in Bolivia in October 1967. Despite this setback, which came as a strong blow to Fidel on both a political and a personal level, Castro continued to act as a supporter of revolutionary movements in the years that followed throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. In the 1970s, it was Africa where Castro became most active on the world stage and in his support for other revolutions. In the mid-1960s, he and Guevara had supported rebels in the Congo against an American-backed regime. This strategy was expanded in the 1970s, with Castro referring at the time to Africa as the weakest link in the imperialist chain. Consequently, in 1975, hundreds of military advisors were sent to Angola in southwest Africa where a civil war had just broken out following the country's independence from Portugal. Castro's advisers were sent to aid the Communist People's Movement for the Liberation of Angola against the Western-backed National Union for the Total Independence of Angola. It was the start of an enormous role which Cuba played in a bloody Angolan civil war, which would drag on in one shape or another for 27 years, 
By 1991, over 370,000 Cuban military troops and a further 50,000 Cuban civilians had served in Angola as doctors, nurses, and in other roles. This means that nearly 5% of the Cuban population served in Angola in some capacity during the first 15 years of the civil war there. Nor was this the only front in which Cuba fought in Africa at the time. Fidel Castro also involved the nation in civil wars and revolutionary engagements in countries such as Somalia and Madagascar in the late 1970s. Despite the country's increasing role in fomenting and supporting revolutionary movements across Africa in the 1970s, Cuba's relationship with the United States and its allies improved slightly in the latter part of the decade. This occurred as a coalition of leaders, including President Luis Echeverria of Mexico, Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau of Canada, and the US President Jimmy Carter, combined to offer to improve relations with the island nation. In particular, Carter was willing to abandon the antagonistic stance which had been favored by his predecessors in the White House, notably John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon. And while Carter continued to criticize many aspects of Castro's regime, he also entered into meaningful negotiations with a view to improving relations between the two neighboring countries. Castro agreed to release numerous political prisoners and put in place measures which would allow Cubans who had fled to the United States following the revolution 20 years earlier to temporarily visit family back in Cuba, albeit under strict conditions. For his part, Castro hoped that the United States would end its economic embargo on the country. While this did not happen, the more punitive measures were watered down, providing some financial respite. Despite certain successes at home within Cuba in developing the country's education and healthcare system, the country was blighted throughout Fidel's long tenure as head of state by an oppressive authoritarian government. As elsewhere globally, the communist regime did not accept challenges to its authority, and there was little scope for political dissent, press censorship, and efforts to root out bourgeois or counter-revolutionary elements within Cuban society were rife throughout the period of the Cold War, though especially so during the so-called Grey Years, a period of nearly a decade during the 1970s, when Castro's regime was particularly oppressive. During this period, there was widespread cultural censorship of poets and artists, and harassment of intellectuals and academics. The homosexual community suffered in particular during these years. The net result of all of this was a growing swell of individuals seeking to illegally leave from Cuba to head to the United States, the state of Florida being just a small boat ride away from the country. The gray years began to taper off following the establishment of a new constitution in 1976 and a loosening of some state control over the arts, but political dissent remained anathema to Castro's regime for years to come. The persecution of individuals within Cuba for opposing Fidel's authoritarian rule led to a major development in 1980, which has shaped much of the Cuban community in the United States. After years of oppression and efforts by tens of thousands of individuals to leave Cuba, Castro's regime decided to temporarily open a port in order to allow individuals to leave the country. This was the port of Mariel and its harbor, lying some 40 kilometers to the west of Havana. For over six months between the 15th of April 1980 and the end of the following October, the port was open for anyone who wanted to leave Cuba for the United States. In total, before it was closed again just over six months later, approximately 120,000 Cubans left for the US. What has become known as the Marielle boat lift became a political issue in America, where the administration of President Jimmy Carter was unsure what to do with the arrivals if they continued to come to the US in such numbers. By the time that Marielle Harbor was closed again, the huge influx of Cubans into Florida and the city of Miami in particular had changed the demographics of the Sunshine State in ways which have had implications down to the present day particularly so as the Cuban-American vote are a large group with their own political lobby in a state which is consistently a swing state in American presidential elections. The 1980s brought considerable change to Cuba under Fidel's rule. The country's economy yet again declined, owing to a global fall in the price of sugar, the country's main export commodity. Unemployment rose sharply, as a consequence, Cuba, which had successfully wrested itself away from Soviet influence to some extent in the 1970s, 
found itself drifting back towards a reliance on Russian subsidies and the Russian export market again. Yet this was a time-limited strategy. In 1985, Mikhail Gorbachev had succeeded as General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. A reformer, he began to initiate a series of new policies which aimed to modernize the Soviet Union and bring an end to the Cold War which had entered a more intense period again since Ronald Reagan had entered office as US President in 1981. But Gorbachev's reforms had unintended consequences, and by the late 1980s, the Eastern Bloc of communist countries stretching from East Germany to the borders of Russia were agitating for wide-ranging political reforms. In November 1989, the Berlin Wall fell, reuniting the city, the division of which had become a symbol of the Cold War nearly half a century earlier. And two years later, the Soviet Union collapsed, bringing an end to the conflict between capitalist America and communist Russia. The implications of the collapse of the Soviet Union were profound for Castro and Cuba. For 40 years, Fidel had fashioned himself as the arch-nemesis of America on the country's very own doorstep, one who had been an ally of the Soviet Union. Moreover, the country had been resoundingly reliant on Moscow for financial support to help its economy at various times between the early 1960s and the late 1980s. But now, as the Soviet Union collapsed and the Cold War came to an end, communist regimes such as Castro's were being overthrown rapidly in countries such as Poland and elsewhere across Eastern Europe. There was a strong possibility that the same would happen in Cuba, but Fidel quickly moved to ensure a continuation of his rule. He strengthened his control over the Cuban military to prevent any revolt from within the armed forces and temporarily allied the country with other regimes across Latin America which were fellow antagonists of the United States. Through such mechanisms, Castro was able to ensure a continuation of the communist regime in Cuba beyond the end of the Cold War, though the United States indicated its intention to continue to apply pressure on Castro's government by securing a vote to the United Nations Human Rights Commission accusing his regime of widespread human rights abuses. The survival of Castro's regime beyond the end of the Cold War ushered in an era which Fidel referred to as a special period in time of peace. But despite Castro's assertion of this being a special time, the raw truth of the 1990s for most Cubans was one of increasing destitution. The country was now continuing to face economic sanctions from the United States and was cut off from the funding and support which it had long received from Moscow. Gorbachev's successor as head of the new Russian state, Boris Yeltsin, possessed a deep antipathy for Fidel, and the country offered virtually no support to its former ally. Thus, despite some piecemeal efforts to improve relations with some Western powers, Cuba's economy collapsed in the early 1990s. By 1992, economic activity had declined by nearly 40% on the level it had been in 1990. Electricity shortages were widespread across the island nation, petrol to run cars, and for other purposes was in short supply, while imports of essential goods such as Russian manufactured cars completely dried up. Over time, there was a domino effect as increasing shortages of raw materials saw Cuban factories being shut down, further driving unemployment and economic decline. Thus, the special period was actually one of economic freefall in Cuba. The economic crisis of the early 1990s did produce a response. Within broader Cuban society, there was a clear undercurrent of unrest at the difficulties ordinary people were experiencing. In response, the regime sought to ameliorate the economic situation before it led to efforts to overthrow the government, as had happened across Eastern Europe. Accordingly, from late 1991 onwards, piecemeal plans were being initiated to allow private industries to operate in Cuba and to permit the use of American dollars as an alternative currency. In addition, some political reforms were initiated which aimed to make the country's government more representative of the people and to bring in younger political leaders to replace many of the senior figures who, like Castro, had risen on the back of their involvement in the revolution back in the 1950s. Inward and outward travel were also relaxed and this contributed greatly to the rejuvenation of the country's economy as tourism, with most visitors arriving from Spain and Latin America, quickly replaced sugar production as the most important sector of the Cuban economy. As a result, by 1996, the country's budget deficit had been nearly eliminated, 
and foreign investment was increasing, though with criticisms abounding that the socialist ideals of the revolution were being betrayed. Despite this deregulation of parts of the Cuban economy, Fidel himself continued to present himself on the world stage as the inveterate opponent of capitalism and sided with many regimes around the world which were antagonistic towards the United States and the Western capitalist powers in general. Some of this was retrospectively statesmanlike. For instance, Castro had long been a firm opponent of the policy of apartheid, practiced by the South African government, and indeed, Cuba's long-running involvement in the Angolan Civil War had partially been to provide aid to South African dissidents. As a long-standing friend of the leading anti-apartheid campaigner Nelson Mandela, Castro was asked to attend Mandela's inauguration as the first black president of South Africa in 1994. Perhaps more controversial was Castro's leadership of a new alliance of Latin American states which espoused an anti-American stance and favored socialism. In this, Fidel was most closely aligned with Hugo Chavez of Venezuela, with Castro providing healthcare expertise from Cuba in return for Venezuelan oil. Other countries such as Bolivia would associate themselves with the Pink Tide as this movement became known, but the subsequent collapse of Venezuela politically and economically has considerably tarnished the reputation of this initiative. It was also in the post-Cold War period that Castro's personal life became a subject of some attention. This followed from the defection of his daughter to the United States in 1993 when she sought asylum there, after which she widely criticized her father's regime. Castro's wider private life was a closely protected thing and also substantially unconventional. He married at least twice, but also had several long-running affairs. His marriage to his second wife, Dalia Soto del Valle, resulted in five sons, but he also had numerous other children from his other relationships. His closest relationship, though, was with his younger brother, Raul, his associate in power since the late 1950s. Generally, though, Castro was known to be taciturn and private, and despite being the head of the communist regime, Fidel did not eschew having more material wealth than the average Cuban, and, in addition to a large estate called Punto Cero in Havana, he had several other large residences and often traveled by limousine. Despite this, the public image of the man who was referred to as the Comandante or the Commander throughout his long reign was carefully manufactured and controlled and Castro rarely appeared in public wearing anything other than a green military uniform. In 2003, the Cuban National Assembly granted Castro a further five-year term as president of the country. However, just three years later, in July 2006, Fidel transferred power on a provisional basis to his long-standing ally and brother Raul Castro. Initially, this hiatus was intended to allow Fidel sufficient time to recover from surgery which he had undergone for a serious intestinal problem which had led to internal bleeding. It was the first time since the Cuban Revolution's success and the victorious entry into Havana in 1959 that Fidel was not effectively at the head of the state. This retirement was made permanent a year and a half later. By February 2008, the Comandante had not been seen in public for over 19 months, and when the National Assembly met to determine who would serve as president for the next five years, it was possibly unsurprising for Cuba and the wider international community to learn that Fidel, who was 81 years of age at the time, would not stand for another term. Instead, power would devolve to his brother Raul, who was elected as president of the National Assembly on the 24th of February 2008, bringing to an end his brother's 49 years as head of the communist regime in Cuba. Castro's retirement was spent largely out of the spotlight as his health deteriorated. He continued to publish articles in Granma, the official newspaper of the Cuban Communist Party, and occasionally gave public lectures. He composed his memoirs, the first volume of which appeared as The Strategic Victory, and provided an account of the war against Batista's regime in the 1950s. In 2011, he relinquished his last major position in politics when he stepped down as Secretary General of the Communist Party of Cuba in favor of his brother Raul. Yet he continued to play something of a role on the international stage in his final years, becoming an advocate of nuclear non-proliferation and warning of the risks of a war between the United States and a nuclear power such as North Korea. However, he did not meet with the US President Barack Obama when, in March 2016, he became the first American head of state 
to visit the country since the revolution. Just over half a year later, Fidel died on the 25th of November 2016 of an undisclosed illness. A funeral procession was undertaken along the route through which the revolutionaries had traveled across Cuba in 1958 and early 1959, before his ashes were interred in Santa Ifigenia Cemetery in Santiago de Cuba. The Cuba that Fidel left behind after his nearly half a century as its dictatorial ruler is one of mixed legacies. Today, the country continues to be ruled by the Communist Party of Cuba as a one-party authoritarian state, in much the same way as other communist regimes such as China survived the end of the Cold War. However, like China, the country has been forced to move away from a strict adherence to socialist ideas since 1991, though Cuba had remained a strong advocate of left-wing Latin American socialism. As such, there is still a planned or controlled economy there, one though which does allow limited private enterprise and which has become increasingly reliant on tourism. The growth of the latter sector has opened Cuba up to the outside world in the last 20 years in ways which were unthinkable for most of Castro's tenure as head of the regime. However, there are many things which continue to blight the lives of Cubans. The country has a poor human rights record and one of the worst records in terms of freedom of the press. Meanwhile, the economy remains markedly underdeveloped and continues to have some economic sanctions imposed on it by other countries. And yet, a series of political and economic reforms in recent years offers the prospect of a more open society and economy developing in the near to medium future. Fidel Castro was an individual with a lengthy political career, which it is difficult to assess. He started as a Latin American revolutionary, one who wished to remove American influence from Cuba and reform the country's politics. There is no doubting that when he led the Cuban Revolution in the 1950s, that the island was bedeviled by appalling corruption and misconduct in government, epitomized by Fulgencio Batista. Thus, there was a considerable legitimacy to anyone reacting against the government in Cuba at this time. However, owing to the manner in which the Cuban Revolution occurred during the 1950s, it quickly drew the new Cuban government into the political influence of the Soviet Union. As a result, the country became a central agent in the Cold War in the early 1960s, and was infamous for being the environment in which the United States and the Soviet Union came closest to nuclear war. However, the most long-lasting impact of this was that Cuba was and continues to operate under economic sanctions which the United States has maintained for over 60 years. The economic problems which this created cast a long shadow over Cuba and its economic development during the near half-century that Fidel Castro ruled the country. Whatever the circumstances of the Cuban Revolution and the island's role in the Cold War in the late 1950s and early 1960s, there were several decades thereafter during which Castro's reign over Cuba can be evaluated. Based on these years, it must be viewed as a fairly mixed legacy. Some reforms and innovations which were introduced into Cuban society were very positive, and the country enjoys an education and healthcare system which is accessible to all and which would be the envy of the average American who has to pay high fees to access the best universities or shop around for jobs which offer private health insurance. As a result, Cuba has been able to make remarkable medical breakthroughs for a country of its small size and is a net contributor to global medical aid efforts. But contrasted with this is the fact that Castro's Cuba was a highly oppressive authoritarian regime which persecuted much of its population over the last half century in order to maintain Castro and his followers in a position of unchallenged power in Havana. Castro may be regarded as a man who oversaw a regime which demonstrated how communism could benefit many of its citizens in the realms of education and healthcare, but whose rule was ultimately sullied by his repressive actions and authoritarianism. What do you think of Fidel Castro? Was he a nationalist patriot who liberated the Cuban people from an oppressive dictatorial regime? Or was he simply another dictator himself who in turn oppressed the Cuban people? Please let us know in the comment section. And in the meantime, thank you very much for watching. Download Rise of Kingdoms to support the people profiles. Join Rise of Kingdoms Civilization competition. Final round, we chose Rome one of the greatest empires of the ancient world.
And like Fidel Castro, who was president of Cuba for 32 years, you can choose what peoples you lead. Choose from 12 civilizations, each with their own distinctive generals and soldiers. Build your own civilization in this real-time strategy game. Maybe Rome, maybe Byzantium. You can make it an invincible empire where you will experience realistic battle scenes, use your unique soldiers, architecture styles, commanders, and your own buffs to reign victorious, making you the most powerful leader in the kingdom. Feeling excited? Join global players in an alliance. You will live together, farming, discussing commanders, destroying your enemies, and participating in battles to make you more powerful among the 100 million global players than you could possibly know. Click the link in the description, fight for the civilization you support, to win awards including iPhone 13s and AirPods. This video is sponsored by Rise of Kingdoms. Download it now and support the people profiles. Hello guys, thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoy our work and would like to support the channel, please visit our revamped Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee membership pages which contain rewards such as early access to our content, merchandise discounts, and audio versions of our videos, along with much more that we give to our valued supporters. If you have not yet signed up to help our cause, we'd like to ask you to please consider doing so, as we need to secure the channel by safeguarding it from possible demonetization and also invest in better equipment software, and more people to help us improve our videos going forward. In short, without your contributions, these videos would not be possible. So if you would like to ensure this channel never has to shut down due to demonetization, please spare whatever you can per month and become People Profiles patrons. Thanks for listening.